And I want to begin in verse number 11 and read down through verse number 19 and share with you a, a fascinating thought that is found only here in all of Scripture, an intriguing thought that maybe you have never considered. We all know, we would agree, surely everyone in this building would be of the same mind in saying that Jesus is and was God. John chapter 10, verse number 30 says, I and my Father are one. Literally, it says, Brother Jeremy, I and my Father, we together are one. I, singular, my Father, singular, we, plural, together, plural, are one, singular. Now, that's as strange as it comes, but we know that Jesus is God. There's no argument about that. The very first verse we're going to read tonight reaffirms that Jesus and the Father are one, that Jesus is God. But here's what I want you to think about tonight. In the second verse that we're going to read, Jesus makes a statement that will really kind of shake you a little bit. He says, you who are not God can do greater works than I did. Consider the narrative of John chapter 14, verse 11. Jesus said, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for, every, for the very work's sake. Verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I pray the Father. And he will give you another comforter. That, you may abide, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. But you shall see me. Because I live, you shall live also. Have you ever thought about that? That the Lord Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh, said to his disciples, You can do greater works than I did. Now, if we give that some context, we have to think a little bit about what's going on. We're told in the book of Exodus and again in the book of Leviticus, and this is reminded of us throughout the entirety of Scripture, that there were three times a year when every Jewish man went to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. Pentecost, Tabernacle, and Passover. Every year at Pentecost, all the Jewish men who could went to Jerusalem to worship. Every year at Tabernacles, all the Jewish men who could went to Jerusalem to worship. Every year at Passover, all the men who could went to Jerusalem to Passover. Now, take that into the Gospel of John. In John chapter 2... The Bible says that Jesus went to Jerusalem for Passover. In John chapter 6, the Bible says that Jesus went to Jerusalem for Passover. In John chapter 11, the Bible says that Jesus went to Jerusalem for Passover. That one time a year event which required Jewish men to come to Jerusalem was observed by Jesus in John chapter 2, in John chapter 6, and in John chapter 11. What does that mean? Well, it means what you've been told all your life. This is where we come up with the calculation that Jesus' earthly ministry was three years long. We know that because it's calculated in the book of John. John chapter 2, year 1, Passover. John chapter 6, year 2, Passover. John chapter 11, year 3, Passover. Thus we have this formula that gives us an idea about how long Jesus was on this earth during his public ministry. Three years. Now here's the deal. When you consider that Jesus' ministry lasted three years, you could say, and you'd be right, that's a pretty short time. But man, he did a lot in three short years. You would be right in making such a statement. 
Now take that into the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we have basically the, the ministries of Peter and Paul chronicled for us. Philip is in there as well, but it's primarily Peter's ministry and Paul's ministry. And the book of Acts covers 30 years. It is the historical record of the early first century New Testament church. I'm 55. In two weeks, I'll be 56. Just tell the truth. I was saved when I was nine years old. I've been doing this for more than 30 years myself. I sure did it more than three. Here's what Jesus meant when he said, and you shall do greater works. Not greater in quality. I'm not a miracle man. I'm not a miracle worker. I'm not a better teacher than Jesus. I'm not a greater rabbi than Jesus. I'm not a better prophet than Jesus. But God has left me on this earth for a longer period of time. He has every right to expect greater things from me. Some of you have been here longer than I have. Maybe been saved longer than I have. I, my years are adding up. Listen, God has every right to say, Hey, Roger, get after it, boy. I left you here for a reason. Now think about this. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse number 1, the very first statement made in the book of Acts is this. Luke is writing to Theophilus, the friend of God. That's what Theophilus means. And he says in Acts chapter 1, verse number 1, these are the works, these are the things, this is the stuff that Jesus began. Acts 1, 1. And then in Acts 1, 2, it says very plainly, and Jesus gave commandments to his apostles. What do you suppose he was commanding them? Well, we learn throughout the entirety of Scripture, but very specifically in the book of Acts, the commandment Jesus gave to the apostles was, Hey, guys. Well, he probably didn't say, Hey, guys. But he said, Hey, my purpose for your life is for you to finish what I started. We have evidence of this all through the Scripture. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was walking along the shores of Galilee. He saw some fishermen. He said, follow me and I'll make you to be fishers of men. And they did. And he commissioned them with preaching the message, the gospel of the kingdom. They were called disciples. In Matthew chapter 10, he changes the language a little bit. The vernacular changes a little bit. And now they're called apostles in Matthew chapter 10. And he sends them out two by two by two. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, 6, and 7, you know what he says? I'm sending you out to preach the message of the kingdom. What John started in John chapter 1, what Jesus was doing on the shores of Galilee, what Jesus called the disciples to follow him for, what he gave the apostles commissioning for, was to continue to share this message, the message of the kingdom, the message of the gospel, wherever they went. Now we come to John chapter 14, and Jesus says, I'm leaving. I'm going to my Father. But when I go, in my absence, don't quit. Don't wave the white flag. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Jerry Falwell's dead, been dead for several years. And I may or may not have agreed with a lot of stuff that Jerry Falwell said, but he said something one time that stuck with me. I heard him preaching at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, when Adrian Rogers, who's also dead, was holding a Bible conference. I went over there during the week one time, and I heard Jerry Falwell preaching. And here's what Jerry Falwell said that stuck with me as a young preacher that I have never forgot. He said, it's always too soon to quit. And he's right. It's always too soon to quit. You know what Jesus was telling his disciples? Don't quit. Don't quit. He said in verse number 12, I'm going to the Father. I'm leaving, guys. But you have a job to do in my absence. 
Listen, in the absence of the Lord Jesus Christ, that message has not changed. From Matthew 4 to Matthew 10 to Acts 1, throughout the entire ministry of Peter and then later in Paul, even down to today, in the absence of Jesus Christ, the message remains the same. Don't quit. Have you ever sung the song, I have decided to follow Jesus? Well, don't forget the last part of that. No turning back. No turning back. It's easy to sing it. It's easy to say it. It's sometimes hard to do it. But in the end, is that not the plan of the Lord? Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't wave the white flag. In the absence of our Lord, don't quit. You say, well, how am I going to do that? What, what in your right mind, Brother Roger, makes you think that I can do that? I'll tell you what makes me think that. The promise the Lord gave us. Jesus said, and you know this verse. Let's keep it in context. Jesus said, in my absence, you will not be orphaned. You will not be left alone. I am not going to leave you comfortless. We read it right here in John 14. Jesus said, when I go to the Father and I'm going, I will not leave you alone. I will send a comforter to help you do this. The Holy Spirit, the comforter, the paraclete, para, like parallel lines, you know, like these Rows of pews like railroad tracks into the distance as far as you can see, side by side, steady as she goes. Never will they ever cross or mix or mingle. You can follow them from here to yon. You have right beside you the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the comforter. God said, I will not leave you alone to do this by yourself. I'm going to give you help. You have a comforter right beside you who is in you and with you, the Bible says. Right here in John 14. This idea that preachers have, that missionaries have, that evangelists have, that church members have. This idea that I'm the only one left. Woe is me. Nobody else cares. I guess I'm going to have to do this by myself. That's almost heresy. Nobody does this by themselves. Now, I may not come along beside you, and I might be sorry as the day is long, and your best buddy may not come along beside you, and you may be abandoned like Paul was in his ministry by some people he thought would be faithful all along. But listen, you can rest assured in this promise, God's not going to forsake you. God's not going to fail you. God's not going to leave you. And even though Jesus left this earth, in his absence, he said, I'll send my spirit to comfort you. You do not have to do this by yourself. I'm not God, but I got him living in me. I'm not God, but he's walking beside me. I'm not God, but I have the promise of God that says, I don't have to do this by myself. Listen, my friend, you don't either. But we must do it. Listen, it's not that you can do greater works. You must. How long have you been saved? I've been saved 45 years almost. I am getting old. That's a long time. I've been saved longer than the book of Acts. I've been saved longer than the public ministry of Peter and Paul. I've been saved longer than the public ministry of Jesus. God has every right to say, Roger, I expect something out of you. You've been doing this long enough. There ought to be some evidence. There ought to be some fruit. There ought to be something in your wake that says you're about my business. God's got every right to expect that of me. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I'm going to the Father, and in my absence, you can do greater 
things that I did. Not greater in quality, but greater in quantity. Again, I'm not a miracle worker. I'm not the greatest rabbi. I'm not the best prophet. I'm, I'm, not, I'm none of those things. But God has left me here a long time to do his work. And short of something happening unexpected, I suspect I'm going to be here for a while yet. God expects greater things. The message of Jesus Christ was then and is today the same. And in his absence, though he is gone, the message has not changed. The message really is, is, is summarized in two words. Go tell. I mean, that's, that's it. That's really the message. Go into all the world and preach, tell, share the gospel to every creature. It's the Great Commission. I love what Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 8, you know this verse. Isaiah 6, verse number 8. The Lord says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? You remember that? And Isaiah responded with five words. Five words, I believe, that changed his life forever. Five words I think will change your life too. Here am I. What did he say? Send me. That's Isaiah 6, 8. Unfortunately, most of us stop right there because after God said, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah responded with five words. God retorted with two words. Isaiah 6, 9. You know what those two words were? Go tell. Check me out, see if I'm wrong. In Matthew chapter 28, a crowd of people arrived at the empty tomb of Jesus, and there was a lot of stress in that moment, a lot of anxiety in that moment, a lot of, let's be honest, a lot of worry in that moment. They stole the body, they've moved him, they relocated. Where did he go? What happened? All of whom had forgotten his promise to rise from the dead three days later. The angel told them in Matthew 28, Why seek you the living among the dead? This same Jesus, you know, it's more stated more like that in Luke. But nonetheless, the, the narrative is the same. In Matthew chapter 28, verse number 6, upon discovery of the empty tomb, the gardener said to the skeptics who shouldn't have been skeptics, Come see. I love that. Look for yourself. See it with your own eyes. Let this affect you. Can I ask you a question? Has the resurrection of Jesus Christ affected you? Boy, it has me. It changed me. It changed me forever, eternally. I'm not the same guy I was when I was eight years old. Now, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a bank robber, a drug addict, and all those things when I was eight years old. But I was a sinner. Still am. The difference is when I was nine, I became a saved sinner. And I got saved because Jesus rose from the dead. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 6. Come and see. But listen, I love verse 7. Go tell. Listen, my friend, that's the message of the gospel. Go tell. That's why Jesus left his disciples on the earth when he said, I'm going to the Father. Go tell. I mentioned Brother Eduardo Magana our missionary in Mexico. When I was a seminary student, Brother Jeremy, back in the mid-80s, you know, you weren't even twinkling your mama's eye. You told me earlier you were born in the 90s, right? When I was a seminary student back in the mid-80s, right after my wife and I first were married at the Missionary Baptist Seminary in Little Rock, <clears throat> Brother Eduardo Magana and his wife Gabriella were also students there, and they were a couple of years ahead of us. <clears throat> Brother Eduardo had been led to the Lord by Brother Victor Guzman, who recently passed away while living in Mexico City, and he had come to the seminary in Little Rock, was going to get his Bible education and go back to Saltillo, Mexico, which he did, started a, a new work with him and just his wife and his oldest daughter named Anna, who have all been very good friends of ours for many, many years. And one day during the warm months of the year, uh, my wife and I were going to go back to Clarksville on a weekend to visit with her family, and I was loading up tackle boxes and fishing poles in the back of my little white Toyota pickup truck, 
and Brother Eduardo Magana, who I didn't know was doing it, was standing on top of the hill at the seminary apartments there in Little Rock. And he was watching me load all of these things out of my apartment into uh, my little pickup truck. And when I went back inside to gather up suitcases for my wife and me to spend the night at her folks, he finally couldn't take it any longer. He said, Brother Stewart, what are you doing? And I could hear in his voice and see in his face, he thought, he's quit. He gave up on God. He quit the seminary. He's moving out of the apartments. He's leaving the ministry. All he knew was there was this young preacher boy and his wife loading all their earthly goods in the back of a little old bitty white Toyota pickup truck. He didn't know I was just going for one night, but I had plans. So we were putting everything we had in the back of this picture. He said, Brother Stewart, what are you doing? And I could see it on his face. I could hear it in his voice. And I said to him what any good Arkansan would say. I said, well, I'm fixing to go. And he looked at me with the strangest look on his face, and he said, how do you fix a go? And you know what? A lot of us need to. Our go is broke, isn't it? Let's be honest. God help me to get my go fixed. Because the message of this book is two words. Go tell. And Jesus said, I'm going back to the Father. And in my absence, you have one job. Go tell tell and in that with the lifetime of service Jesus said now you think about this Jesus said you can do greater works than I did that blows my mind because I'm not God but I got him inside of me he's walking beside me and his promise is I can be effective for his kingdom until Jesus comes. This is my prayer for you. Go tell. Father, thank you for our time and the blessings that you give, for the attention that these good people have given me tonight in this report and in this short message. May you be glorified in our lives as we go and tell of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Brother Jeremy.